There is a legendary creature in the Pacific Northwest that has captivated imaginations for centuries. Bigfoot. Join Bad Things as we explore the folklore, major sightings, and scientific investigations into this enigmatic myth. Are footprints and video footage of this massive primate elaborate hoaxes, or is there scientific evidence that there once was, or still is, a mythical creature hiding in the foggy forests of North America? In 1958, Andrew Genzoli, a journalist for the Humboldt Times, highlighted an intriguing yet skeptical letter received from a reader about loggers in Northern California who discovered footprints of an inexplicably large size. Maybe we have a relative of the abominable snowman of the Himalayas, Genzoli wrote jokingly alongside the letter in his September 21st column. Genzoli later explained that he had simply believed that the puzzling footprints made a good Sunday morning story. But to his astonishment, readers were enthralled. In response, Genzoli and colleague Humboldt Times journalist Betty Allen published follow-up articles about the footprints, detailing how loggers dubbed the alleged creature responsible for the footprints Bigfoot. As a result, the modern legend of Bigfoot was born. The modern legend may have started gaining traction in the late 50s, but the Bigfoot mystery was eons in the making. Although firmly ingrained in contemporary American culture, the myth surrounding Bigfoot has its roots well in the pre-21st century. Several indigenous cultures throughout North America have legends concerning cryptic forest-dwelling creatures covered in hair, and this folklore predates modern-day accounts of the creature by thousands of years. The specifics of these legends varied by region and even among households within the same communities. At the Painted Rock site on the Tule River Indian Reservation in California, petroglyphs purportedly carved by a Yoka tribe represent the family, a collection of Bigfoot-like creatures, with the biggest glyph being referred to as Hairy Man by the indigenous tribespeople. The petroglyph's age is estimated to be between 500 and 1,000 years old. In the localized interpretations of these legends, the creature was appointed a distinct name in each language. Numerous names have descriptors resembling hairy man or wild man, while others characterized routine behaviors attributed to the so-called beast, such as swaying trees or consuming shellfish. The Staelis people recount tales of a forest-protecting, shape-shifting creature known as Saskets. People who belonged to the Lumi tribe referred to them as Tsemaquez. Certain regional accounts describe more menacing beings, the nocturnal Stiaha or Kui Kui Ai. These beasts were, like other mythical beings in Eastern European folklore, used to scare children by their parents. An aggressive hair-covered giant with rock-hard skin, known as the Ot Neyahe or Genosqua, is described by the Iroquois. Although Bigfoot was seen by some tribes as a menacing monster, other tribes saw the creature as a spiritual being that was here to help humans, not harm them. In Henry James Franzoni III's Legends Beyond Psychology, the traditional tribal attitude to Bigfoot was put as follows. Here in the northwest and west of the Rockies generally, Indian people regard Bigfoot with great respect. He is seen as a special kind of being, because of his obvious close relationship with humans. Some elders regard him as standing on the border between animal-style consciousness and human-style consciousness, which gives him a special kind of power. Franzoni goes on to write, But special being as he is, I have never heard anyone from a northwestern tribe suggest that Bigfoot is anything other than a physical being, living in the same physical dimensions as humans and other animals. He eats, he sleeps, he poops, he cares for his family members. However, among many Indians elsewhere in North America, as widely separated as the Hopi, the Sioux, the Iroquois, and the Northern Athabascan, Bigfoot is seen more as a sort of supernatural or spirit being whose appearance to humans is always meant to convey some kind of message. Many have put the Native American Bigfoot narrative in a box with other out-there myths that were concocted to tell stories around a fireplace. Surely the new, and according to them, more sophisticated colonizers of North America wouldn't buy into these fairy tale stories of giant hairy apes trudging through the forests of North America. 
Think again. It is widely believed that a journal entry from 300 years ago in Natchez, Mississippi has the earliest documented account of a Bigfoot in North America. It is taken from a passage in the journal of French Jesuit and explorer Pierre-Francois Javier de Charlevoix, S.J., titled Charlevoix's Louisiana. The first night I lay in the settlement, there happened a great alarm about nine o'clock in the evening. Upon asking the reason of it, I was told there was, in the neighborhood, a beast of an unknown species, of an extraordinary bulk, and whose cry did not in the least resemble that of any known animal. Nobody, however, could say he had seen it, and they formed a judgment of its size entirely from its strength. It had already carried off some sheep and calves, and worried some cows. I told those who gave me this account that an estranged wolf might very well have done all this and that. As to its cry, people were deceived in these matters every day. I could persuade nobody, they still would have it that it was some monstrous beast. It was heard again, and everyone ran out armed with what he could find, but it was to no purpose. While he was unable to confirm an actual sighting, the possibility is that a creature resembling Bigfoot may have been responsible. If this is the case, then this account would represent the earliest documented accounts of this creature in North America, originating from white settlers. Reports of animals similar to Bigfoot continue to be made in the region around Natchez today. Jose Mariano Mathino documented a further early account by early colonizers in 1792 in a journal titled Noticias de Nutka, an account of Nutka Sound. The journal was composed at a time when the Spanish and English were exploring the Pacific coastline. The Viceroy of New Spain, Juan Vicente Güemes, commissioned an expedition to the Pacific coast in 1792 to gather a comprehensive ethnography, which is a branch of anthropology and is a systematic study of individual cultures of the local population. Curiously, Mathino's journal detailing the expedition went undiscovered until 1913. Upon its discovery, it was translated into English. Mathino described in his journal a mountain-dwelling humanoid known as the Matlog, which wreaked havoc on the tribe's people. Matlog was said to have possessed a massive, grotesque body clothed in hair resembling hard black bristles. Although human in form, the creature's head was considerably larger and featured pointed, powerful canine teeth resembling those of a bear or wolf. It had long limbs with curved claws on its hands and emitted a terrifying shriek. Most people are skeptical of these accounts given the period that they were recorded and the people of the era's overriding belief in myths and folklore. Are there any modern Bigfoot accounts before the Humboldt Times article that may be proof of the wild man? Unsurprisingly, there are many detailed accounts and stories, with one story coming from a name all of you will recognize. Here are the bad things top three modern Bigfoot sightings and accounts, and stay tuned for how the Bigfoot myth has its roots in concrete scientific evidence. The Albert Osman Abduction, 1924 Albert Osman, a gold prospector, maintained that he lived with a Bigfoot family for roughly a week in 1924 near Toba Inlet in British Columbia. Osman was camping alone when, according to him, a male Bigfoot snatched him from his sleeping bag and took him to meet a female Bigfoot and their two offspring. Osman, who claimed to have been held captive by the family, eventually escaped after the male Bigfoot ate his smoking tobacco. The descriptions provided by Osman regarding his captors bear resemblance to one recounted by William Rowe in 1957. Osman's account, which he claimed occurred in 1924, was not documented until 1957, following his exposure to Rowe's narrative. Consequently, Rowe's account might have served as a source of inspiration or influence for Osman. Our next account wasn't merely an account with a Bigfoot, but a battle with multiple hairy big feet. Ape Canyon, 1924. The incident at Ape Canyon took place in 1924. A party of gold prospectors maintained that they defended their cabin against numerous gorilla men in a gorge on the side of Mount St. Helens, which was later named Ape Canyon. 
Fred Beck, a miner, is said to have fired upon a Bigfoot during the day, inciting a group of its shaggy friends to attack the miners in an act of revenge. It was reported that the creatures bombarded the miners' cabin with boulders and rocks, and one even reached its hairy arm into the cabin to get to the prospectors. The miners managed to withstand the attack, and the creatures retreated into the forests as the sun started to rise, possibly after Beck shot one of them. Beck accompanied rangers from the U.S. Forest Service back to the location as soon as word of the attack spread. The Oregonian newspaper reported at the time that the rangers were unimpressed with the large rocks discovered next to the cabin and the purported gigantic footprints in the area. The officers appeared to believe that the rocks were manually placed there by the miners and that the footprints were the result of human activity. Skeptics frequently propose, as an alternative to the miners simply fabricating the Ape Canyon tale, that the miners were attacked by a group of local teenagers amusing themselves by hurling rocks at the cabin. Our last account, although second-hand, comes from none other than the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Teddy Roosevelt. The Roosevelt Account The finest hunting ground in America was, and indeed is, the mountainous region of western Montana and northwestern Wyoming. Theodore Roosevelt wrote in The Wilderness Hunter, a book he published in 1893 about his experiences in the American wilderness. He hunted the continent's big animals like bison, moose, grizzly bear, white-tailed deer, and beavers. He loved the fresh air and hearing the fascinating stories of other hunters. Roosevelt heard a story on one of his hunting trips that was unlike any of the other stories he heard in his years in the wilderness. Roosevelt had never heard of a creature as peculiar as the one at the center of this story, despite his extensive knowledge of the flora and fauna of the western region. Roosevelt reminisced in his memoir, It was told by a grizzled, weather-beaten old mountain hunter named Bauman, who was born and had spent all his life on the frontier. Roosevelt relayed in his memoir, he must have believed what he said, for he could hardly repress a shudder at certain points of the tale. Roosevelt recounted that while Bauman was still a young man, he and a companion went out to trap beaver in an isolated river valley in what was then the territory of Montana. They went up a mountain pass where, the year before, a lone trapper had been killed by an unidentified beast. The half-eaten remains being afterwards found by some mining prospectors, who had passed his camp only the night before. They dismounted their horses at the pass's base and proceeded upwards to a narrow valley where they set up their lean-to. They went to set their beaver traps in the stream while there was still some daylight left and came back to camp just as the sun went down. When they got back to the campsite, they were startled to see that their lean-to had been flipped over and their pack's contents were all over the ground, with bear-like tracks in the dirt. Using a torch created from the campfire, Bauman's companion saw the traces. Bauman, he said, that bear has been walking on two legs. Bauman laughed the idea off, and the two trappers went to sleep after fixing the campsite. Later that night, Bauman woke up to the smell of something foul and the shadow of a great body in the door to their shelter. As soon as he fired his weapon, the beast fled into the surrounding woodland. The next day, the two hunters spent time checking their traps in the streams. When they got back to camp, their lean-to was destroyed again. Around the camp, the same big tracks were seen leading to a brook. Bauman now agreed that the thing had gotten away on two legs, no matter what it was. They hardly slept that night because of the sound of twigs snapping in the dark from the mysterious animal circling the camp. As their fire blazed, the trappers sensed it waiting and heard its blood-curdling cry echoing through the woods. Bauman and his friend agreed to leave this creepy valley the next morning. They pulled their empty traps from the stream, but had the eerie feeling that something was watching them. Bauman offered to get the last three traps from a river nearby, and his friend made his way back to the campsite. As Bauman cleared the brush leading to the campsite, he stumbled into a horrific scene. He saw his friend's still warm body leaning against a tree. His broken neck had four fang marks on it. There were telltale tracks all around the victim. The beast hadn't eaten his friend, 
but merely romped and gambled round it in uncouth, ferocious glee. Bauman and Roosevelt never said that the killer was a Bigfoot. However, the creature's two-legged stance, foul smell, and long screams in the northern woods are all similar to what people have described in Native American stories, though the Bigfoots aren't violent killers in those stories. If these stories and accounts aren't true, where does the source material come from? Who came up with the original myth, or is the original myth fact? An anthropologist, Ralph von Konigswald, was making his rounds in one of the many traditional Chinese drugstores in Hong Kong. He came across strange primate molar teeth that were being sold as dragon bones to be used in traditional medicine. These weren't any ordinary teeth, they were massive. By 1939, after buying more teeth, he decided they had originated somewhere in Guangdong or Guangxi. He could not formally describe the type specimen until 1952 due to his imprisonment by Japanese forces during World War II. Von Konigswald had stumbled upon the fossils of an extinct ape species. Not just any ape species, a giant ape. In 1956, the first mandible and more than a thousand teeth were found in Luchang, China, and many more fossils have since been found in at least 16 sites. Von Konigswald named this new species Gigantopithecus blackei. Gigantopithecus was once thought to be a hominin, a member of the human line, but evidence suggests it is closely aligned with orangutans. Measurements of the fossil teeth allowed paleontologists to estimate the primate's height and weight at about 9.8 feet and 441 to 661 pounds, respectively. Such calculations point to Gigantopithecus as being the largest hominid yet known. The oldest fossils date to 2 million years ago from Baikong Cave, and the youngest 380,000 to 310,000 years ago from Hai Cave in China. The cause of its extinction is still an open question. It is possible that ecological changes precipitated its demise. An alternative explanation for the extinction of Gigantopithecus might be the arrival of Homo erectus in the region. The size and presumed terrestrial habits of the giant ape would have made it desirable and easy prey. So, according to scientists, one of our predecessors and Gigantopithecus's timelines may have overlapped in ancient history. Could tales of giant hairy wild men have been shared as an oral tradition through the ages? And how did this myth make its way onto the North American continent? Most archaeologists and geneticists agree on the best explanation for how the first people came to the Americas. They used an extinct land bridge to cross the Bering Strait from Asia to the Americas. This is probably the story that most people have learned in elementary school. Thanks to progress in genome sequencing and data analysis, we now know that some of the first people to live in North America, called Paleo-Americans, were related to people who lived in Siberia in the past. This is strong evidence for the land bridge hypothesis. These people no doubt brought their myths and folklore with them over the ice wastelands into the Americas. Do you think that Bigfoot exists? Share your opinion in the comments section below. We would love to see on what side of the fence you sit on. What's the bad thing's take on the Bigfoot phenomenon? Debunking this cryptid isn't hard. The Great Ape of North America Most people think that Bigfoot is an undiscovered species of primate that looks like an ape, but is smarter and more evolved than any other species we know of. Some researchers call it the North American Great Ape, but this is just a theory. But there is a problem with this idea. There are no apes in the Americas, and there is no proof that apes ever lived in the Americas. Although there are monkeys in South America, they are very different from monkeys in other parts of the world. This difference comes from 40 million years of evolution. There is no proof that apes or monkeys lived in North America, before Europeans came. The Bigfoot Gigantopithecus theory, on the other hand, tries to explain how Bigfoot evolved from an ancient ancestor in Asia and moved to America. But what proof is there that this is true? 
there are no fossils or bones that have ever been found proving this theory. It doesn't make sense to think it's some kind of human species either. As far as we know, Neanderthals and Denisovans were the last human-like species to live on Earth other than us. Another problem linking Bigfoot to any species of humans is that any massive ape-like creature isn't smart enough. Even the most basic human would use weapons and tools, build fires and shelters, and leave other clues for us to find. There is no such evidence for another humanoid species in the Americas. Native Americans and Bigfoot Anthropologists will tell you that stories from Native American tribes have led them to believe in Bigfoot. Native American cultures have long-standing stories about big, hairy creatures that look like people who live in the forest. Some cryptozoologists think this is proof that the animal has been here at least as long as people have. However, anthropologists will also tell you that many Native American stories are a mix of the real, the spiritual, and good old-fashioned fairy tales. Oral storytelling, as opposed to writing down their history in books, was the primary method by which these cultures preserved their history. In some cases, this oral tradition may have gone back tens of thousands of years and included tales about animals that no longer exist, or that did exist in a different part of the world, where the people who told the stories came from. These were people who had to figure out how to live in a natural world that was often frightening and hard to understand. They used their religious beliefs and spiritual explanations for things they didn't understand. Native American myths also talk about lake monsters, shapeshifters, creatures that look like fairies, and horned serpents. Are all of these real? Or does it make more sense to say that Bigfoot is just one part of a very large and complex set of spiritual beliefs and oral histories? Fake Video Proof of Bigfoot Video proof is one of the most argued over types of proof in the Bigfoot sphere. At first glance, it seems like clear video proof of Bigfoot in the wild would be unarguable, and the doubters would have to finally admit that it is real. Of course, this never happens. The video is always grainy, out of focus, or shot in a way that makes it hard to see what the subject is. Videos aren't very useful as proof, unless we can see what we're looking at. It's safe to say that unless DNA evidence, clear legible video footage or a Bigfoot body dead or alive is found, that Bigfoot will remain in the realm of the mythical cryptids of the world. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.